I'm Lynn Staley, and I'm going to be talking about pediatric orthopedic history and also about the recent advances in this, in, uh, that's occurring in global health and, and POA. And this was a talk given in, in uh, Columbia at the Slotty meeting in 2016. I want to bring you greetings from Seattle, the home of Starbucks, Microsoft, Boeing, and the Gates Foundation. It's nice to be back in South America, and I've had some spectacular experiences here, as well as a, a week in Guatemala in 2016, and visiting the Galapagos Islands, Machu Picchu, Angels Falls, and Torres de Pines, and the, and the other falls. Really impressive, and you have a beautiful continent. I want to also thank you for the invitation, Miguel and Stalia, and also for the, having an opportunity to exhibit the Pediatric Orthopedic Academy, and also for having uh, on, our on your website, uh, a link to the Pediatric Orthopedic Academy in Spanish. We had, did have a nice meeting with many friendly colleagues, and we had a POA uh, Global Health exhibit, which we appreciate this opportunity of showing what's happening with the organizations. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the history of Global Health, and then some inspiration from Dr. Fonsetti and from Salman Khan, the creation of POA, and also the new Spanish POA website and the videos. Historically, we can consider Hippocrates as the father of uh, medicine and gave us the Hippocratic Oath. And his first um, dictum was to do no harm. And this is particularly important in pediatric orthopedics where children do well if they don't have complications. He also described the children's hip dislocations and observed that it was curable if treatment was started very early. You note know, this was clear back in 500 BC. Probably considered most commonly the, the father of pediatric orthopedic was Andre uh, Nicholas, or Nicholas Andre, who was a, physician, a French physician and writer. <clears throat> he was a parasitologist first and an orthopedist second. In 1741, he wrote Orthopedia, gave us our logo, and uh, made some observations, some of which were quite wrong. For example, he said that walking too soon in childhood caused bow legs and flat feet, and was uh, very impressed with the need for postural control, prevent scoliosis, and so forth. So he made some good observations, but also some that set orthopedics back a couple of uh, centuries. Another factor that involved children's orthopedics, and especially development, was the establishment of children's hospitals. And you know, season, these were started in the 19th century in Paris and London and the east coast of the United States. And I was surprised with this information from Dahlia that the hospitals in, in, in Latin America <clears throat> really started earlier. We had, for example, the first children's hospital in Mexico in 1519. And this was followed over the decades by these other hospitals you can see, which were established well ahead of those <clears throat> in much of the rest of the world. The Shrine Hospital system, which is important in pediatric orthopedics, was started in 1920 in Portland, Oregon. And currently there are 22 hospitals around the country and around the world. <clears throat> One of my heroes is Walter Blount, who described tibia vera, scoliosis bracing, and guided growth with stapling. Rapid pro to this conference, he focused a lot of his interest in children's fractures and wrote a book on the subject, and the book is freely downloadable from our Global Health website. He pointed out the importance of looking at the patient. For example, this cartoon shows a doctor focused on the x-ray, whereas the child was uh, suffering, and the, the child saying, Doctor, let's treat the, x let's treat the child, not the x-ray. He also pointed out that children were left to their own devices will regain motion at a possible rate. He felt it was unnecessary to have physical therapy for children after, for, after fractures. And this child on the lower left saying, carry the sand yourself, uh, because I don't really need to. I would do it fine by myself. Or on the lower right, showing the stretching of the elbow by a physical therapist saying, this is really hurting me. It's really not helping. And we'll talk about how this has been proven to be correct later on. One of the other great contributors um, for pediatric orthopedics was Mike Tashin. He... Um, was uh, family were uh, from Armenia, 
And during the den genocide, they moved to Lebanon. And then Dr. Tashin had his training in Switzerland and then to Boston, where he did his residency and also uh, for a short time on the, bas uh, on the faculty uh, in, in orthopedics. He then moved to Chicago <clears throat> and uh, did a number of things which still have lasting significance. He spent two years at the Fairmont Hotel writing a textbook on pediatric orthopedics, three volumes, which really set the specialty of uh, a new from having a very erudite, erudite uh, beginning. He established a pediatric orthopedic seminar, which is still active. I don't think they give him credit for beginning it, but he did. IPOT is still a think tank for orthopedics and still is active, and he was also a personal friend of ours. In 1981, <clears throat> We established the, the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics. This was the idea of Alan Edelson, who owned Raven Press, and a friend of his who is a pediatric orthopedist, Stu Posner, suggested there needed to be a pediatric orthopedic journal. And so he started, said, well, I'll, stay, I'll start one. And he looked around for someone to be the editors, but no one would take it on, especially the, the older guys who were um, the most able and most uh, widely known, because they considered it political suicide to take on the uh, editorship of a journal which is considered to be promoting fra the fragmentation of pediatric orthopedics. So Bob and I took it on, being naive and young. And this, is, uh, this was with the concurrence of our colleagues. Over the years, there developed a number of regional societies. It was POSNA, EPOS, then SLOTI, and then a lot of national organizations sprang up. SLOTI was established in 1999, and a number of your people here or on the original uh, editorial or uh, developmental boards, uh, and also covered a large part of the world. For instance, Europe has 750 million people about. The, the uh, Latin America has 630 million, and USA and Canada has only 375 million. So Latin America is really substantially larger than, than North America. Another motivating event was a 9-11 disaster. And... Um, <clears throat> And this uh, made us think, what could we do to really improve the situation? We didn't agree with the military response of invading Afghanistan and Iraq and other countries. We thought, well, what's the problem? What are the problems that we could de help deal with? And we uh, taught in about 40 countries and observed that the medical publications were greatly valued and often were far too expensive for people to own. And this picture was taken in Antalya, a turkey. And you notice how bored the woman looks. And she's bored because people couldn't afford to buy the books. It would also take uh, several months' salary to buy one book. So books were really in short demand. So we thought that we would develop an organization to provide free books, healthcare information, particularly for the underserved. And with the philosophy of being humanitarian, non-political, and valuing diversity, both in racial, cultural, and religious uh, aspects. And over the years, the organization evolved to focus primarily on children's problems of pediatric orthopedics. This led to the development of a website uh, that many of you have visited. This is our new design, which is going to be coming out very shortly. And then the, also the development of subsites for pediatric orthopedics. We call them POA, Ped Ortho Academy, uh, both in English and in Spanish. And the organization has had significant impact. And these are new stats from Global Health Organization. So we've had nearly half a million views of our 200 videos, our materials in 35 languages, and it's down, been downloaded about 17 million times, nearly every country in the world with over 160 titles. <clears throat> and if you look at the, at the uh, number of the downloads, there's been a dramatic increase in the last few years. At the beginning, we thought, well, if we ever get to a million, we'd be thrilled. Now we're about 17 million, with a rapid in, uh, increase in the last couple of years. So Global Health, Op, uh, Global Health Organization, we first started by focusing on, on uh, uh, the clubfoot, because Ponsetti was creating a way of treating club feet, which is revolutionary and could be used around the world easily. We've, t we've gained a book on pediatric surgery in Africa. We established a DVD library of all of our materials, which are available inexpensively. We have 30 textbooks, and now we have the pediatric academies, which we'll talk about. Another very inspiring person is Dr. Ponsetti. 
Dr. Pinzetti was a refugee from Spain. He was on the Federalist side and the non-fascist side, and when that side lost, he had to move out of the country. He first went to Mexico, and then he went to Iowa, where he had, uh, had uh, experienced his career. He was very creative there. In the 1950s, he did an anatomical study and also recognized where the real, uh, where the way that, that uh, 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 cleavage should be corrected uh, by, uh, by manipulation. And he had developed this, and it was very scientifically based, but it did not catch on. And he was very disappointed, as were others who presented the method. And I remember Stu Posner saying, and we kept talking about the Ponsetti method, but people were bored and they never asked the questions and they didn't seem to be very interested in it. And it was a hard thing for orthopedists to accept something that would replace their operation. So he then focused on, focus, he focused on scoliosis management. But families and the internet really changed all of that. And we'll talk about that. And they also did a number of research studies and then development in the 1950s, the anatomic research, he showed that the material, the outcome studies were really exceptional, especially in the long term. He detailed his technique, and then others started reporting good results about 2000. He also did something which was unusual. He focused, made a focus on function rather than deformity, because most of the people were focusing on the x-ray of the foot of kids with, with, with club feet. And he said, well, the feet are plantigrade, strong and flexible. That's what's really the thing that's important. He also established the fact that excellent function and pain-free status were present at 40 years follow-up, and no other technique has come anywhere near close to that kind of, kind of uh, outcome. And then the whole thing changed with the Internet, and patients were coming to Iowa City for treatment of their club feet because they tell their friends, and they had clubs about clubfoot clubs or groups, and they said, "This you have to go to Iowa City because they've got a uh, way of treating without surgery, and it's much, much better. So people came to Iowa, and that really established the interest in, in his uh, technique. So clubfoot take up, took off, and we were there early, and we created this clubfoot book called the Red Book. It was a small book, and a lot of color, color illustrations. It was very graphic, and we've had, had tens of thousands of downloads, and over two million uh, uh, PDF downloads in nearly every country in the world in 35 languages. So it took off very quickly and was used around the world as a primary uh, guide for managing club feet. It was also selected by WHO for the, troop, for the Blue Trunk Library and considered one of the best books and most useful books for that purpose. Another offshoot was this it was the Uganda Sustainable Clubfoot Pro Project of Dr. Uh, Peroni. He uh, uh, focused on creating sustainability so that, so that they created within the, within the country, and this was started in Uganda. And Dr. Pramprani realized uh, that it was necessary to get the buy-in of the local people, which he did, and they're doing it very effectively, and the Minister of Health and all. And this has been cited by WHO as one of the most successful programs developed, and we helped with working out the Clubfoot Manual, which is given to uh, 20,000 people in Uganda. The next step has been in Bangladesh. There's a new, new project. Again, Dr. Prony has a grant from the Canadian government to create a sustainable work uh, program there. And we're working on a new book, this is, which is a, a pocketbook, which is printed on uh, waterproof paper, spiral bound so it stays open, with all the text on the left and the color illustrations on the right-hand side. And it will be available for Bangladesh use primarily but also a generic version will be made available for the rest of the world. So that's coming up. And Global Health has been co collaborating on the, his project that's, that's run by Dr. Uh, Dr. Prony. Another book that was very important was a pediatric surgery, a comprehensive textbook from Africa, created by Africans for, Af for Africa. And this was very important because they created a lot of these, uh, these great books, but no publisher would take it on because there's no money in it. So they asked Global Health to take it on, which we did, and we printed a uh, 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 thousand copies, which were distributed. Uh, there were 150 authors creating 155 chapters. It's a big book, and now it's free on our website. And we've had uh, 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 seven, I think it's 750,000 downloads now of either the total book or parts of the book, and a second edition is underway. Another recent book is a new primary surgery textbook. 
by Dr. Uh, edited by Dr. Michael Cotton, and it's had a record number of downloads per month since we put it on the website uh, beginning of the year. Another book is the Anesthesiology Book, Anesthesia Care of Pediatric De Patients in a Developing Country, written by two eminent uh, pediatric uh, anesthesiologists, and is again available free on our website. Um, another approach to this was uh, creating material within the countries where uh, the, the uh, management was, uh, uh, was uh, experienced or created. An example was a book by Kelly Ledbetter, who was a pre-med student, and her parents were doctors, and they said, what can Kelly do? Suggest she go to Nepal and work with doctors there to create a, a booklet or information that could be used elsewhere. <clears throat> so in Nepal, a lot of the babies would fall in the fire because that's where they were doing their cooking, and end up with burns, burns and then contractures. And so the local doctors developed a way of managing these. And so Kelly teamed up with these doctors and created this wonderful book now that has hundreds of thousands of downloads. And, and it took an experience that, that, uh, uh, that became kind of an editor. And now she's uh, going through a residency in plastic surgery with a planned uh, uh, profession of being a burn specialist. Another thing that's available is, uh, is uh, material on libraries. And for example, we've had this, uh, all of our material on been on DVDs, which you provide for a dollar. But now there's a lot of videos. And also the DVD players are not available uh, on most new computers as uh, USB ports have taken their place. So we're changing over to USB drives, which will be, have the capacity of including all the videos as well as all the PDFs. And this is available for people who don't have internet access or the internet is inconsistent or very slow. We have a whole new section on, on medical books. So we have 30 books that are on the history of medicine, so surgery, orthopedics, pediatric orthopedics. For instance, Mercer Rank's book is on this. So this is another area of interest that might um, uh, appeal to you. We're uh, having a project underway of of archiving the books on poliomyelitis. As people are dying off, you know how, or are retiring, we know how to deal, deal with poliomyelitis. So this is important because polio may not be through. We have an underway a project with uh, Kay Wilkins of archiving his wonderful trauma collection of creating videos from his multiple PowerPoint presentations. Another approach is having patients develop their videos, like this Kobe story just came out. Kobe was born with very short arms, club hands, and no thumbs. And he shows how he copes with it. And he's been very, very successful academically, uh, sports-wise, as he's been a page in legislature. And he has several videos showing how to do this, which are very inspirational and would be very helpful for, for other children and other families to view, showing how coping with a problem is sometimes more effective than trying to do massive surgical under, uh, reconstructions. Cost-saving solutions are very important because it allows funding to be available for more of the population. And an example of this on the left-hand side is the fracture pinning using ultrasound. This was um, proposed and experienced in Vietnam. I was there a couple of years ago. They were using ultrasound. They said, well, an ultrasound machine costs $8,000. A C-arm costs $220,000. And often was broken. They, didn't, they couldn't afford to fix it. So using ultrasound was very effective. And it's probably one of the imaging modalities we don't use enough. Or got another one's on the right-hand side of uh, showing how you can do epiphysis with a suture, temporary epiphysis. And rather than a plate, you can put a suture around the heads of the screws. And then when the deformity is correct, you simply cut the, cut the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the suture through a little nick in the skin, which makes a lot of sense. There are a lot of ideas that save money that can be utilized effectively. An example of saving money is a children's hospital showing how an old cast saw is still used, even though it looks terrible, still works fine, and, just, and keeping it saves a lot of money, as do braces, recycling braces, or um, uh, as shown in the, in the lower two views. And we can make videos at the hospital very, very, very efficiently. Another example of this was we talked about earlier that, uh, that Blount had suggested was uh, doing some clinical studies. And they're often very simple, but very, very cost-effective 
and very uh, and very important clinically. And a lot of times they're inhibited by these IRB organizations, which make it very difficult. But for example, Greg uh, Smalley from our hospital took Blount's idea and, and tested it very simply, taking a series of patients who had superconductor fractures uh, and dividing them into two groups, one having physical therapy and the other without. And again, he confirmed what, what uh, Blount has said, that the kids who did not have physical therapy did just as well as those that did. And also save the families a lot of time and a lot of, in the society, a lot of money, taking the kids out of school to go to physical therapy and unnecessarily. So again, some of these simple studies undertaken would make a profound difference if they were, if they were done. Another person that was very inspiring was that of Salman Khan. Um, Salman was a brilliant um, individual who had degrees at MIT and Harvard. And he was uh, employed very profitably. Uh, and, but his uh, niece was having trouble with her math class. So he started teaching his, his niece math. And then all the other kids were seeing how well she did and wanting to be taught. So he thought, well, I can't do this, so I'll make some videos to show how to teach math. And so he did, and he made, personally made 3,000 videos on math education, and then recognized that this was, these other kids wanted these. And he, showed, and he also showed that these very simple videos that he was making were very powerful and very effective. They didn't need to be glitzy. They, the, the important thing was to focus on the problem. And he wrote a book called The One Room Schoolhouse for the World and create a whole new philosophy of, of education. And this philosophy sort of focuses on the so-called flipped classroom, which is catching on now. And the, and the most recognized contributor to this flipped classroom concept is Salman Khan. The idea is that people learn on their own best by watching videos and uh, looking at them over and over again if necessary, at their convenience, in their location. And then when they go to class, they don't they not lectured to, but they learn about learn about uh, how to deal with the problem, and answer questions, and the teacher has interaction with the with the students. And this technique is being tried out at Stanford University using a flipped classroom, and it, inter it increases the interest in teaching, and is maybe the way of the future. And I think in pediatric orthopedics, it's perfect because our material is so graphic that that uh, video education is extremely effective. And it's been now it's being expanded to other universities as you see in the lower right. So with the inspiration of the Khan Academy, we created the Pediatric Orthopedic Academy, or pedortho.org. And this was established first in English, as shown there. And the goal was to make the uh, material as readily accessible as possible and made navigation easy, searching made easy. And the goal is to make this in the, in the priorities. So we go through anatomical location, and then we go to generalize and specific topics and special searches. For example, if it's a hip problem you're looking at, you click on hip, you go to the right, you see all of the, all of the publications on the hip. If you go to author, click authors on the far left, you see all the authors. If you click uh, textbooks, for example, uh, you, know, you go to the right and you find all the textbooks. And, and we recognize that, that um, English uh, was only spoken by, used by 8.5% of the world's population. And so we decided to uh, go to a Spanish version of this. And as we had contacts in, in uh, Santiago and in, in, in the Spanish-speaking world. And actually, the Spanish and the Portuguese together are speakers that outnumber those of in English. And the Santiago team has been very, very effective in creating this. And the new, we have this new website. Uh, they, they do have the website in Spanish. And uh, this is, has a link on your, on your um, uh, home page. And it's been very successful. We started out by have, making videos of one of the medical meetings held in Santiago. Uh, both the, the speakers would make them in Spanish and in English when, they're, when possible. And these have been very successful, very simple topics, uh, but uh, completed very easily and without much energy taken or time taken by the authors. And then we made over a series of a single weekend, whole series of, of um, videos, both in English and in Spanish, which again have been very, very successful. And uh, they're not glitzy, but they're very efficient, like the Khan Academy's uh, material. And some examples 
you know, hyperthes disease, how to put on a pallet harness, uh, upper limb examination. And I might add that families can also use these, like this pallet harness video. Mother can go back and if she doesn't remember all the details, can watch the video again at her own speed and with her family. And now this, their whole new set of videos, uh, and you look at the quality. I'm very, very impressed with what's being done. And these are one on the, on the clavicle fractures. This was one on the, on the wrist fracture, and then one on the clavicle fracture. And we have some excellent material which is available. So please help us. And just as suggestions on how this might be done. Identify books that might be included in the Global Help site. That's why we got the book on extensile exposure and other good books. We ask and we, we scan them, put them on a website, and met a need that people were looking for. Identify people who might be good video makers. Encourage them to make videos. Not everyone can make, can make a good video. Some are natural teachers. And also translate useful books into Spanish. That's, that would be a very useful thing to do. And one of the most important things we think is to create creating a Spanish language pediatric orthopedic syllabus or flipped classroom teaching. So the goal would be to have a comprehensive review of, of uh, pediatric orthopedics in Spanish and, and, this, and the videos that people could learn at their own speed, could be learned by medical students, by residents, by interns, by people in practice, even families could do this and it would be comprehensive. So we hope this will be the way of the future. I wish to thank you for watching this video and please address any questions or comments to me at staley at uw.edu. Thank you.